Hi, it's, a, it's absolutely a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and this is an extraordinary organization. Actually, to me, even more extraordinary is the whole story about the rural electric cooperatives. Uh, I should tell you that I'm a big fan of movies from the 30s and 40s. I just adore Barbara Stanwyck. So you can, uh, and, and I'm not talking about when she was in that West, the West show, whatever, the uh, Western. Uh, and uh, it's really amazing when you see uh, the depiction of what farm life was like, uh, where uh, there wasn't running water, but frequently even when there, wasn't running, there was running water, that you didn't have electricity. And of course, one of the great things that came out of the New Deal was the rural electric cooperatives and actually the support for them by the federal government. And of course, uh, now you're actually very large. From what I understand, I was told that actually your, your growth in terms of the, uh, the uh, growth in terms of your production of electricity has been greater than, uh, than the, the private, the, you know, the, the uh, sort of uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, electric uh, utilities. So that's really an extraordinary story. Uh, and in fact, when you, when you started your, uh, your organizations and, uh, and uh, uh, got federal help in the 1930s, we were going through a Great Depression, the worst financial crisis in our history. Uh, and unfortunately, we're now in hopefully the second worst financial crisis in our history. I think it will be, but this is an incredible major financial shock. In fact, I would argue that the financial shock that we're experiencing now is worse than the one that we had been during the Great Depression. The economy has not had the same uh, uh, response to it, and I would argue that's because the, the uh, Federal Reserve and also the government has been much more active, but nonetheless, the, the uh, harm that has been done to the economy is just major. So what I'd like to do is to give you some background uh, to first talk about how we got here uh, and why this happened, uh, and in fact tell you that there's some good news here. As a financial scholar, I've actually done a, done a fair amount of research on, on financial crises, which are just fascinating uh, uh, events, and as a scholar, this is terrific stuff. Uh, unfortunately, as people have to live through it, it's, it's very, very, uh, very, very difficult. I lost half my pension, and, uh, and so when I'm teaching, actually, I, I love the teaching, but, uh, and it doesn't get any better than this teaching, but I, as long as financially I was in better shape, I'd be happier. And clearly it's affecting your businesses because the cost of raising funds has actually been much higher than it otherwise would be. So let me talk a little bit about what's happened and that then can help us think about where we may be going in the future and how serious the situation is currently. When you look at this particular financial crisis, uh, in some sense it's deja vu all over again. When you study the history of financial crises, uh, there's classic patterns in financial crises, and in fact, this current crisis, which started in the subprime mortgage sector, has many of these classic attributes. So one of the things that made me feel very good is that in my textbook, which actually I've just revised the, the ninth edition, uh, that uh, in my textbook, uh, uh, that for the last five editions, I've had a discussion of financial crises and the theory of financial crises, and the great thing is it all fits for the current, uh, current environment. Most financial crises start either with a financial liberalization or financial innovation that in the long run will actually lead to a better financial system. But frequently they get it wrong. And this is classic. It's happened before. It happened with the South, South Sea bubble with the first corp corporations. Uh, they didn't get it right. And indeed, in this particular situation, we had the same thing happen. In this case, what's remarkable and, and at first hard to understand is that a very small part of the capital markets subprime mortgage lending has blown up the entire system. And so we need to step back a little bit first to ask the following question. Why do we care so much about the financial system? Why is it so important? Uh, the answer here is that the financial system is absolutely critical to a healthy economy because without the ability to allocate capital to productive uses, you don't get an economy that grows. And you know this firsthand because you deal with your, your electric cooperatives. If you can't get the money, to build the power plants, you can't provide electricity to your customers. And, and in, in fact, clearly you've had very good investments over time. You have not had a problem in terms of having uh, low credit ratings because in fact you have had good investments. But in a financial crisis, what happens is that the financial markets no longer work well. And what that does is it means that you no longer can get capital to productive uses. And that actually has two negative impacts. One is in the short run, the economy contracts very rapidly, and we've been seeing that happening in, in spades lately. But also, you're in a situation where you don't build up the capital for the future. And so it's a very, very serious situation. So why did this happen? The innovation of subprime uh, mortgage lending, in the long run, by the way, will be a good thing, 
uh, and in fact, it, uh, uh, the history of financial development tells us that this will actually be something that we're going to see go on in the future unless the government regulates it out of existence, which could happen. And I'm going to talk about the key issue really going forward is, is the government going to get it right? Because if they don't get it right, we're in real trouble. In fact, my fear is that we could either have a very severe recession, maybe we'll even call it a depression, or alternatively, we could have what happened in Japan, 10 years of stagnation which in effect is just as bad. They lost 30% of their GDP relative to the United States during, this, during that period. Remember there was a, a time when everybody talked about the Japanese overtaking the US? Nobody talks that way anymore. Uh, and in fact, uh, I do have worries about this and I'll talk about that with you. So what, what happened here is that there was a new financial innovation. Why did it happen? It was because of technology, because of computers, which allowed you to do two things, which is one is, that you could do something very fancy called data mining. I have a friend who teaches, teaches this uh, statistical uh, 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 techniques to, to his students, where you could actually go out and, uh, by looking at people's behavior and qu quantitatively, actually get very good information whether they'll default on their debts or not. And as a result, you could give a score for how uh, creditworthy the person is. That's the FICO score. It was invented by the Fair Isaac Corporation. Uh, and with that score, you could now quantify this and then technology allowed you to take a lot of small loans and bundle them into larger loans because of, of lower transaction costs. Much, by the way, as in your case, where you bundle all your, your, uh, uh, your loans together and then actually have uh, the CFC actually sell the bonds for you. Very similar. And in this context, this is actually part of the process of expanding credit to a wider group of people, the so-called democratization of credit. And in the long run, that's a good thing because many subprime bars, in fact most, if the loans were made properly, are good investment opportunities. They actually will pay back their loans. The problem here was that with many financial innovations, they don't get it right. And in particular, in this context, what happened was several fold. One was that the model that people were using, the basic business model, was fundamentally flawed. First problem was that this model, which we so -call this, is called the so-called originate to distribute model. You have somebody originate a loan. That's the person who mortgage broker who, who uh, uh, gets somebody to take out a loan and then takes that loan and sells it off to somebody else who may sell it off to somebody else. The problem is that the persons who were originating the loans or doing the selling off into intermediate stages did not worry about whether the loan got paid back or not. All they wanted to do was get money for the fees they generated. And that can create a huge problem because what happens is that you may have people who originate these loans who don't care whether somebody can pay them back. My son had a friend who was working for one of these mortgage brokers. And he would, would go out and he would uh, sell it, he would encourage people to take a loan, as he put it, he would take, willing to, take, to give a loan to, to anybody who could stand and breathe. Because he didn't worry about whether in fact the loan got paid back. All he cared about was that did he get his fee, did he get paid. It turns out this process actually occurred throughout the financial system because it wasn't just the mortgage brokers, it was the people on Wall Street who were fee-driven, who basically said, if I can take this, this, uh, these loans and package them in new securities, I'm going to make money. It was the financial engineers who, who uh, did very sophisticated analysis but didn't think very hard about whether the people had incentives to pay back their loans. And it, it, the bottom line is that this created a situation where we had a huge amount of lending, a credit boom, which created a huge problem because a lot of these loans should never have been made. The second problem is that there was an asset bubble, asset price bubble, that because of this credit boom and also because we had all this money flowing in from abroad, actually an extraordinary event in world history where poor countries were sending money to rich countries. The, the Chinese have a per capita income around 10% of ours. They were sending money to a rich country like the United States because their financial system is so backward that they couldn't keep the money there because it would get stolen. So they'd rather send it to the US. That fueled this huge credit boom, huge increase in, in housing prices, which got way out of line with fundamentals. And of course, when the housing, in, in any case where things get too, too frothy, the bubble eventually bursts. And when the bubble bursts, now you have a real problem because people now start booking huge losses. In particular, the financial institutions who are owning all these securities now are taking very, very big losses. And so they're now going to do what's called deleveraging, that they have to contract, they stop met lending, they put in tighter, uh, tighter credit terms. And the result is a very serious situation where the financial system just completely seizes up.
And that's basically what we've, we've gone through. It started in August of 2007. What's remarkable is not only that this started in a small part of the uh, U.S. financial sector, subprime lending, indicated the rot through the whole uh, business model of securitization, which, is a, which of course you have been very involved in, but you're the good part of the business model in contrast to the bad part of the business model. What then happened is that this then exploded, became a worldwide phenomena, and of course then led to, to failures of major financial institutions, Bear Stearns in March of, of, uh, two, of uh, 2008, and then, of course, the real disaster was when we got into the fall of this year, when the, when the world really fell in. And many people talk about Lehman Brothers as the, as the key trigger. Lehman Brothers was a big problem, but the markets all knew that Lehman Brothers was vulnerable. And in fact, when Lehman Brothers first failed, the markets actually reacted reasonably well until AIG, this insurance company, revealed that it was going to go broke because a small unit was engaged in hundreds of billions of dollars of credit default swaps. And in fact, one of the features also that we've seen is that there have been contracts that are extremely complicated that nobody can really figure out what they mean. Uh, there was a wonderful quote from the chairman of the Federal Reserve, my friend Ben Bernanke, who at one point was talking about uh, uh, CDOs and said, I wish I knew what the hell was inside these, these, uh, these uh, uh, securities so that we could value them. So the bottom line is that this, this world of new finance the so-called shadow banking system basically was revealed to not get some basic ideas right, not worry enough about whether people would pay back the loans. And the whole system just blew up on us. We then are getting closer to the current environment, but it's very important to understand how important a role the government has in all of this. Because what also made things much worse was the initial government response to the crisis, uh, in particular in the fall, when uh, the initial TARP proposal was brought forward to Congress, there were some serious mistakes made by the Treasury Department in terms of the kind of proposal that was made. Uh, and uh, that furthermore, that the Congress then balked, and it took actually just a four days for them to first vote down the, the, the package of bailout. To four days later, they finally passed it. And many of you would think, why would four days matter? Four days is everything in a financial crisis, because once you don't believe that the government is going to take charge of things and actually solve the problem, fear becomes rife. And we get into the situation that Roosevelt talked about, where the, the, the main thing that you have to fear is fear itself. And that's exactly what happened in that situation. And in particular, part of the problem with the way that things have been handled by the Treasury uh, 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 immediately after this crisis was that the American public has gotten furious because money was given out to, to, to financial institutions with no restrictions, and so one of the things that actually you, you, we teach our MBAs is that you should maximize shareholder value. If in fact your firm has too much debt and ha has a huge amount of debt where it may not be able to survive, in fact maximizing shareholder value is paying out any injections of capital from the government to your shareholders, and that's what was done. The problem is that it's made the American public furious, and rightly so. There's a big danger, however. I'm going to tell you a story about my grandfather, Mayor Mishkin. So Mayor Mishkin came to the United States uh, around the turn of the century. He actually walked out of Russia and walked to Hamburg, took a boat to the United States, and then became a peddler. He carried stuff on his back and went door to door selling things to people. And by 1929, my grandfather was doing better. He had a little Army Navy store in, in the, uh, the Lower East Side in New York. And uh, the stock market crash occurred. And he said to my father, who was just uh, starting a school at City College, he said to my father, which is a free college in, in uh, New York, he said to my father, gee, it serves all those rich scandal scoundrels right when the stock market crashed. A year later, he had lost his store. And so part of the problem right now is that the government must go in to fix the financial system. And the difficulty is that the American public is furious because the people who, in fact, are going to get money are many of the same people who, in fact, caused the problem in the first place. But the answer here is that unless the new administration, the Treasury Department and the Obama administration gets this right and fixes the financial system, we will be in dire straits. There's all this attention on the fiscal stimulus package. I'm, I think, actually, the fiscal stimulus package is a reasonable thing to do. There are a lot of issues about details, whether you agree with all the details or not. But the fiscal stimulus package will absolutely not work if, in fact, the resources aren't put in to fix the financial system. And, of course, 
this affects you directly because it affects your ability to raise capital. The problem is that, the, the, that we've spent a lot of, ca of, of a, a focus on spending $800 billion in terms of the fiscal stimulus package. People are furious about the way that the Treasury disperses funds in terms of the initial TARP program. And that may mean that the government is not willing to do what it takes to fix the problem. And uh, you, uh, many of you are sure aware of the, the, uh, the plan that Treasury Secretary Geithner uh, announced last week. And in fact, the uh, markets reacted very poorly to this. In fact, the stock market's down another couple of hundred points today. So it was, it was bad before, it, it has gotten worse, uh, indicating a lack of confidence in the government's handling of this. Uh, and when you actually read Geithner's plan, the plan is actually better than the market reaction. The problem is that, it, for example, one of the key things that the plan mentions is that they're going to do stress testing of the banks to see whether it actually is worthwhile to give them capital. Because if you give capital to a guy that's already broke, it doesn't help. It just means that the government's money is wasted and it will pay for it as taxpayers. That's actually very important, but what the plan did, what it did not say is that part of the solution is going to be that some financial institutions are going to have to be closed down. Because what you don't want to do is do what happened in Japan. In Japan, they put in some injections of capital from the government to, into the banking institutions, but not enough to make them sufficiently healthy. And the result was that we got 10 years of stagnation. And that is a real possibility right now. So here's the question mark. And I think it's a really a question mark for this new, the new Obama administration. If the Obama administration and the Treasury does not get this right, and it's going to take real leadership to convince the American public that one, that we need to fix the problem, it's going to take a lot of money, but in fact, if we don't fix the problem, we're in trouble. If the, if the Obama administration doesn't get it right, then it will be a failed administration. Because unless we get the financial system working again, no matter how much money the government spends, it's not going to solve the problem. And indeed, what we've seen in countries that do not fix their financial problems when they have a financial crisis, and they start spending a lot of money from the government, they end up with a huge increase in the amount of debt relative to GDP. This happened in Japan, which increased its debt to GDP, to G, the debt relative to the size of the economy uh, by a factor of four or five, and it still had stagnation. So that could happen here as well. So I don't think the story is fully written yet, because one of the good things that happened is that the markets basically said to the administration, you better get your act together. Now, unfortunately, it's costly because many of us own shares of stock, and it's, it's, it feels very painful when, in fact, we've lost a lot of money and, and our retirement uh, uh, plans are changed. For me, it's not too bad. I'm young enough that I'm just going to work longer. So uh, that's my solution to the problem. You can tell I have a lot of energy, so I'm not worried about working longer. Um, I actually, as my wife always said to me, that I live to work. Uh, and she's described her situation as she works, to, she, she works to live, so we have a little different uh, view on life. Uh, but, the, but the bottom line is, a signal has been sent that, in fact, unless you get serious about solving the problem, we're not going to get out of this mess. And I think that we could see positive responses where the government does get its act together and really takes the strong steps that actually, if you look at the history of, of uh, the Great Depression, the, the, we, things started to, to get much better when Roosevelt got out and said, we are in a different world, we have to take strong steps, I have to provide leadership. He did not get everything right. So I think on net, uh, what the Roosevelt administration did was extremely helpful. There are some things that they did wrong. The National Recovery Act was actually a very bad piece of legislation, which did hamper the growth of the economy later on. But the bottom line is to not do the serious thing and, and take the steps that need to be done and say to the American public, we may not like doing it, but on the other hand, if we leave the financial system a mess just because we're, we don't like the way people have behaved, uh, then indeed we're not going to solve the problem. And furthermore, part of the solution is to say that we're also not just going to hand out money to people who cause the problem, that if a, if a banking institution really cannot be made viable, we don't want to protect the shareholders. We actually want to say the shareholders should get nothing. The management, if they screwed up, should be thrown out. Now, it depends. There would be a reorganization. Sometimes you keep the management in place because you actually can maximize the value of the firm. You can actually make the firm more valuable by keeping the management there. But on the other hand, it's not like the management is, is, uh, is uh, protected. They're on the block. So I think that part of what we need to see is the government gets serious about this, uh, actually uh, says to the American public it's going to cost a lot of money. That was actually in Geithner's speech. 
He talked about the need to, for, for the government to be involved in purchasing $2 trillion of assets. By the way, it may be more. But then he actually didn't say how the government was going to get the resources to do it. And he left it very vague. And if, if that's the way we keep on proceeding, we will have a problem. But here's my optimistic side. I'm actually hopeful that people, by the way, the people, the Treasury Secretary and Larry Summers, I know them both well, they're very smart people. But now the question is whether, in fact, they and Obama can provide the leadership to get this country out of this mess. And by the way, it's not just the United States here. If the United States does not get this right, the consequences for the rest of the world are going to be even worse. So Europe, I think, has greater problems. Japan, you're reading about Japan, has huge problems now. Their economy is dropping faster than ours. Uh, their their uh, GDP is falling at twice the rate ours is. So this is a worldwide crisis. And if it's not dealt with properly, it is scary. But then again, uh, uh, there is hope. Things can be done if there is time to turn it around. But we'll have to see. So I should tell you that I usually like to be much more upbeat. Um, and uh, I hope I, you know, at least I made you think. But, uh, uh, and uh, you're getting something out of my, my uh, speech today. But uh, we are really in a very dire situation that needs, needs important leadership. And I just hope that we get it from the government at this particular point in time. So with that, why don't I, we open the floor to questions? And uh, I think that they're going to, they have a list. I, I love this, by the way, the, uh, the thing that said, quiz the professor. I just hope you're going to give me a good grade. Well, professor, as uh, typical with this group, we've got way, way more than we're going to be That's able to great. touch. So we'll get right on it. Um, why should basic capitalism, including debt recovery, not just be allowed to work, eliminating unprofitable businesses and loans? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm at, there's echo. Can you just read it very slowly? I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay. Why should basic capitalism, including debt recovery, not be allowed to work, eliminating unprofitable businesses and loans without outside interference by the Fed? Okay, so uh, this view actually was one that was held during the Great Depression. Uh, it, uh, Andrew Mellon was the Treasury Secretary uh, in the Hoover administration. And he described the, the approach to solve the problem, which is liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. And that turned out to be a disastrous policy in the Hoover administration. And the answer is that what you want to have happen is that under normal circumstance, when you get the system working again, the firms that can't survive should go out of business. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned that the stress testing should look at, at banking and other financial institutions and say, if we're back in normal circumstances, are they actually viable? If they're not, we want them dead. So in that sense, we want to let capitalism work. But in a financial crisis, capitalism isn't working well. What's happened here is that everybody basically is pulled back, so the financial system can't function properly. And when it can't function properly, even firms that would normally be viable are going to go broke. And so the liquidate, liquidate, liquidate approach is one of the things that led this country to disaster in the 1930s. Uh, and it was actually only when we stopped thinking that way that the economy started to recover. So the answer is that nobody's happy about this. And there are costs to having government intervention. But the reality is if the government does not step in, that this situa situation right now is one where you have a vicious circle and a downward spiral. And in fact, we've been through that before. We saw it happen to this country uh, 80 years ago. And we do not want to see it again. Can you comment on the current attempts by revisionist historians who are claiming that the New Deal did not end the Great Depression? So uh, actually, I'm very familiar with this literature. Uh, and uh, the part of the revisionism actually is about the National Recovery Act, which I mentioned. The, uh, 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 many of the initial features of the, the, the Roosevelt administration uh, did, and many of the initial approaches actually were very effective in restoring confidence. For example, the SEC is a classic case of good regulation put in place to deal with a problem. We need new regulations to prevent this from happening again. In particular, the SEC made sure that there was less manipulation of the credit markets, that there was more information. Um, this is extremely important in terms of some of the issues that we are dealing with now. For example, the credit default swap market is one where there was not sufficient information so that nobody knew about AIG. And that was the big surprise. 
So, uh, so one of the key things here is that, that, uh, uh, that a lot of what was done in the initial phases was, was very helpful. The National Recovery Act was actually a very unsuccessful piece of legislation. For those of you who don't remember uh, uh, the National Recovery Act, what it did is it created monopolies. So it basically interfered with markets working well. Uh, and it was uh, very ill thought out. And in fact, I agree with the revisionists that that particular piece of legislation actually did help prolong the uh, recovery uh, and actually meant that, uh, that uh, we would have recovered faster and it had never been passed. But on net, I don't agree with the view that the, what the Roosevelt did in terms of overall in his administration didn't help the economy get back, get, get back uh, on, on its feet. But as I said at the very beginning, Roosevelt didn't sit there like a deer in the he headlights. He did stuff and didn't get it all right. But on net, he, the, what, what the Roosevelt administration did did make things better and that was extremely important. So one of the things that's very much concerned to me now, and I think the fear of the markets, is if the current administration is timid and basically says, you know, we're, we're not going to do what it takes because either politically it's hard to sell uh, or there'll be resistance in Congress, uh, then in fact we could have a situation where we basically are paralyzed and paralysis right now could kill us. So, uh, so I think that when you, when you re read history, and it's like very important to do this, by the way, as a scholar, I'm somebody who's done a lot of research in, in economic history, uh, as well as uh, a lot of research on, on, on uh, current economic issues. I've done both. I think it's very important to look at the, the mistakes of the past to get it right. Uh, but on the other hand, one of the things that scholars frequently do is they oversell their cases. So some of the people who've written this revisionist uh, stuff, basically, even though they have an important grain of truth to it, have oversold it. So uh, my view of this is that, uh, that uh, uh, thinking that, in fact, you, you uh, 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 want to avoid uh, uh, any government intervention in the current situation is extremely dangerous. To give you an idea of my, this, the moment when my blood turned the coldest during this crisis was when uh, Secretary Paulson announced that there was going to be no more disbursement of TARP funds and that we weren't going to do anything else. It was about two weeks before uh, uh, the announcement of Tim Geithner's uh, appointment as Treasury Secretary. My blood turned cold. That scared, scared me tremendously. Uh, right now, I am worried about whether the government, whether there'll be some paralysis in Washington. If there is, my blood's going to turn even colder. But, uh, uh, but as I said, a message, you know, a shot's been shot across the bow. There's been a strong message that the, the, that if the uh, Treasury and uh, Treasury, Treasury Department and the Obama administration doesn't go out and get, get really serious about dealing with this problem and explain to the American public that there's going to be a lot of money that has to go into the financial system, but it's for your own good, that in fact, having Wall Street dead means that Main Street's going to be dead with it. So, uh, so I think that there's a, important to get this message out, and that's one of the reasons why I think there's, there's important research there, but it's oversold. What would be the impact of the, what will be the impact of the stimulus package, and how long will it take to have an impact? So, uh, we can't be exactly sure. What I would say is, don't get your hopes up too much about the stimulus package. Uh, that. Uh, uh, Th that uh, th there are several issues and several problems with it. One is that a lot of the spending t takes too long to come on board. You'd actually like to have the spending come as quickly as possible. Uh, that also, uh, that the, uh, 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 thinking that the government can just get us out of this problem by spending a lot of money is not going to be the answer. The answer has got to be that the private sector starts spending money, that confidence returns, that everybody's terrified. I'm scared. Uh, you know, I don't have a financial problem personally that's that great. I mean, you know, I can, I'm a professor, I got tenure, um, I'm not going to lose my job. Uh, you know, I've taken a big hit, but I can still survive fine. My kids are not going to have, well, my kids are, are grown up now, but my kids are not going to starve to death. At least my wife won't starve to death. Uh, and, you know, I'm thin, so I don't need to eat that much anyhow. Uh, but, but, I, but I think that, that, that uh, I'm scared and I'm actually in relatively good financial shape because I have a secure job. People are really terrified. And the, the stimulus package can help by increasing spending, but the bottom line is that unless we get the private sector spending again, in particular in the long run, we need investment. We need guys like you to build power plants. And if we don't get that to happen, we're going to have a problem. In fact, in the long run, one of the things that's, that's been a problem is that American consumers do not save enough. Now, some people might say, well, then, uh, isn't it good now that they want to save more right now?
There's an issue about the timing. What we'd actually like is not for them to start uh, cutting their spending now, but in the long run, we actually need that households cut back their spending, but that the private sector comes in and does a lot of investment so that there's capital to make sure that our children are going to live well. And also that we actually have less, that we have a situation where we're less dependent on foreigners in terms of providing us with capital. So I think the issue here is that the stimulus package I think will help, but it's not the main thing that's going to get us out of this mess. And the one danger here is if there's too much hope pinned in the stimulus package, I think that that may mean that we don't focus on what we have to focus on. So if the stimulus package, by the way, helps by saying we spent money, uh, which is going to help Main Street, now we actually have to allocate re resources to get Wall Street working again. So, you know, you, I, I watched the, uh, the, uh, the movie about J.K. Uh, uh, Smith, and it was, you know, it was a wonderful thing that he understood that, in fact, that there had to be an alliance between the farmers, the rural areas, and Wall Street in order to get electricity to the, to the people that needed it. So the issue here is that, that, uh, that uh, if the stimulus package helps people recognize that they have to also spend money to make the financial system work, that's good. But it may not meet, it, that may not be, the, be what happens. So, you know, my, my view is to some extent that the stimulus package is, is a sideshow here. It's important, it has some benefits, but it's not the main thing that's going to tell us whether in fact the economy is going to get back to health. If, uh, no matter what, the economy is going to deteriorate over the next year or so. So unemployment is going to continue to go up even if they do everything right and the financial system comes back quickly. But if the financial system does not start to get, get, get back on track in the next six months, we have a really dangerous, dangerous situation. So, you know, uh, I worry a little bit when I talk like this that, that uh, it's much e easier if we had this at dinner and everybody had a, had a couple of glasses of wine uh, because I do worry a little bit that you may slit your throats afterwards. But, uh, uh, but and actually, this is a very large group. There are 5,000 people here. That's too many throats being slit at one time. So, uh, but, but it is a very serious situation, and there is hope. I, I actually think there are very smart people in this administration. The question is, do they have guts, and do they have the leadership qualities to get us through this mess? Do you expect the stock market to tank again in April of 2009 when many of the subprime mortgages reprice? Okay, I never try to predict the stock market. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'll tell you stories. I'm actually a buy and hold guy. Uh, um, my f financial advisor actually is a family friend, had the following description. Uh, when I was at the Federal Reserve, it turns out we have a financial disclosure form where you can see all my assets. It's actually on a, on a public web website. By the way, it's not necessary. They should know every security I hold in terms of, who, you know, uh, what securities held to worry about conflicts of interest. But it was actually a great intrusion in terms of my privacy to have people know exactly what uh, uh, every asset that I, that I hold in the amounts. Uh, but there was a report in, in the Wall Street Journal that said I had an eclectic portfolio. And it, 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 uh, in the eclectic portfolio, it said it had a, 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 a Tootsie Roll stock and shake, shake and, shake and steak. Well, the Tootsie Roll stock was a present that I got one share when I was bar mitzvahed at age 13. So uh, basically, I don't try to time the market. I actually tell this to my students. It's in my textbook uh, that unless you actually have the feel that you have better information, which I don't feel I have, uh, so I can't really predict this. I just hope that the stock market doesn't tank uh, because if it, if it keeps on going down from here, that's scary stuff. This one says, I have heard of many possible solutions, solutions such as nationalizing banks, setting up a bad bank, letting the banks fail, and lifting mark-to-market rules temporarily. What would you recommend? Okay, but that's, but these questions are great, but this one, I would have to give you an hour lecture on this, this question because there's so much in it. Uh, let me be very precise about an issue about nationalization, because this is really important. Uh, and uh, there are two kinds of nationalization that, uh, that are being talked about. And one is, is one that I actually think we're going to need to have some of it, and the other is scary, uh, tremendously scary. So uh, the kind of nationalization that makes sense is that, there are, that, that if the Treasury is serious, they do these stress tests, we are going to have financial institutions that no matter what, the, if the government gives them capital, it's just wasting taxpayer money because they're not going to be strong enough to actually have the incentives to make the kind of loans that should be made. Uh, and those institutions need to be taken over by the government 
and their assets sold off, their toxic assets would just be sold off directly. They have, will have viable businesses that can be, can be sold off in a resolution process. And you can call that nationalization because for a period of time, the government would have to take over these institutions. But the idea is that the government is doing it basically as reorganization to get those assets out in the hands of the private sector of people who can manage them well. So that's actually nationalization that needs to be part of the story. I wish I'd seen some of that mentioned in, uh, uh, in Geithner's speech on this topic, which was not mentioned. Uh, but there's a second kind of nationalization that's really scary, which is having the government run banks. Okay? And think about this. Think about the Congress running banks. Now, they've already, no, the just thing, how scary this is, it's, there's already discussion along these lines. This is why uh, when I think about what could happen, I, saw, I was, you know, some mornings I wake up, I feel, gee, they'll get it right, and then some mornings I just wake up in an absolute cold sweat. So uh, one thing that people in the government said, we want to make sure that the banks are lending, so we want to tell them how much to lend. In Japan, the banks were given money by the government, they were told to lend. What did they do? They lent to corporations that were not viable, so-called zombie corporations. As a result of doing that, the Japanese economy was made incredibly inefficient. And as I said, they lost 30% of their GDP relative to the US. That's something that, does, that scares me uh, terribly. Research shows that co countries that have big government involvement in the credit sector grow much less. And that could happen. There are people in Congress who talk that way. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, the whole discussion, uh, 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 what we had happen with, uh, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac was in fact the government going in uh, uh, and interfering with capital markets in a, in a way that was going to blow up. In fact, I, in my textbook for the last four editions, I had a, a box on Fannie and Freddie saying, this is a bad scene, it's going to blow up. And, you know, sure enough, it did. Unfortunately, it blew up in a more spectacular fashion and at a bad time than I, than I had hoped for. Uh, but I think there is a huge danger. Uh, if the idea is that, that the government takes over banks and then tries to run them for a period of time, that is extremely scary. So I think we have to be very careful about that. So one issue is, do I think we need to take over some banks and close them down? Absolutely. Until the government admits that they're going to do that, we will not solve the problem. Every successful resolution of a financial crisis in the modern era has involved the governments going in and cleaning up the banks by taking some over and then selling off their assets. Uh, let me give you a case of hope. We had a major banking crisis in the, this country in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So a lot of you are old enough, so you remember this. Uh, um, when I talk to some of my students, they don't always, but uh, uh, th this group surely does. And in that situation, the government did two things. First of all, the government did a lot of very bad things in, the, in going up to it, where they did half measures bailouts. So there was legislation passed in 1987. The Reagan administration asked for $15 billion to clean up the, the savings loan mess. Uh, the, the Congress only gave them $10 billion. They needed $50 billion. The legislation actually made things worse. Finally, we get to 1989 at the very beginning of the, the George H.W. Bush uh, administration. And uh, one of the first things they did is they allocated $150 billion to close down uh, unviable savings and loans. And then they sold off the assets through the RTC. And in fact, it was successful getting the system working again. The second thing they did is they actually re-regulated the, the banking system. So putting in new regulations, if it's done right, can help. They actually went in created new regulations, particularly with the, the legislation in 1991, uh, the so-called Fiducia Act, and with that legislation, put the banking system on a much sounder footing. In fact, if that had not been done, and we had the banks in, in the kind of regulation they had before 1991 in this current environment, we'd already be in a depression. The banks actually had a lot of capital on hand so that when they took these losses because of the stupidities in terms of some of the, uh, the, the assets and structured products and SIVs and all these other things that they held, that uh, in this situation, they actually started with enough capital so the losses meant that, we, that, that uh, um, um, most of them are still viable. So there are cases where the government gets it right. So that's why I say there's, there's hope here. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it, it takes leadership. In fact, uh, the first Bush doesn't get enough credit for for, uh, for, uh, for, for what he did in that, in, in that context. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, it was very important because it shows what can be done. 
and we've seen other countries that have gotten right. We've also seen countries that have gotten it wrong. I keep on harping on Japan, but there are many other countries that have gotten it wrong. Uh, most of them actually are, are much poorer countries. The reason you mentioned Japan is because they're the second largest economy in the world and an uh, advanced economy. But if you get it wrong, then you've got real problems. So we're at a crossroads in our history right now. I'll put a couple together uh, in a five-year window here. How high would you expect interest rates, and would you do you see significant inflation occurring? That's a great question. Uh, the, the answer is uh, I don't, but with a proviso. Uh, the current Federal Reserve, now I'm biased here, by the way. Uh, I was a member of the Board of Governors until September of 2000, uh, 2008. Uh, I've known Ben Bernanke for 30 years, uh, and, uh, and um, a good friend of his. Uh, the danger right now is not inflation. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I had an op-ed in, in, uh, in the Wall Street Journal in September saying that there's all this focus on inflation is the problem. The danger right now is deflation. That uh, we're in a situation where inflation actually right now and headline inflation is now below zero. Uh, that if inflation expectations actually start to drift downward, we could get into a situation like Japan where they kept on actually being worried. The, the governor of the Bank of Japan uh, uh, in, in uh, the late 1990s and early 2000s kept on saying, I'm worried about inflation, when in fact the danger was deflation. And the Bank of Japan then did not take the steps that it needed to to make sure that inflation stopped being negative and it was disastrous for their economy. The Federal Reserve understands that. That's why it's taking extraordinary measures to uh, get the economy going again. And I, you know, again, I'm biased here because I was part of these decisions. But one of the reasons why the economy, with the nature of the shock that we've had, as I've described it to you, this is so pervasive, to clean this up is going to be a nightmare. But yet the economy is just in a recession and not something worse. Uh, there is, however, the following danger. These, these, uh, the Federal Reserve has gone out and done some extraordinary things. It's grown its balance sheet. The balance sheet went from something like $800 billion to over $2 trillion, uh, has put a lot of liquidity into the system. Uh, that's exactly the right thing to do at this point in time. But when the financial system starts to recover, the Fed has to take all of that liquidity back in. I'm not worried at all with the current leadership at the Federal Reserve that they will do that. They very much understand this, the issue of the exit strategy here. They, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, they understand exactly what needs to be done. Uh, and also, there's no problem with courage to do the right thing, which is to take that liquidity out when it needs to. Be, needs to. There is a problem, however, is that, is that, we've, that in, in January 2010, Chairman Bernanke's term is, is uh, uh, going to be over. And there's an issue about whether he'll get reappointed or not. And there's a lot of question marks about that. For sure, the economy is not going to be in great shape uh, by, uh, uh, by January of 2010. I can assure you the unemployment rate will be higher than it is now. So it's not clear to me who will be the next chairman of the Federal Reserve. And if we got bad, bad leadership there, we could have a problem. And there have been points in time when, in fact, we have gotten bad leadership. One of the things that I've advocated very strongly, I was not successful in getting this to happen at the Federal Reserve, uh, that I, I very st strongly advocated the Federal Reserve should have an explicit numerical inflation goal. Sometimes that's referred to as an inflation target. But the word target is not a great word because it sounds like you have to hit it exactly all the time. Uh, I, I think actually that's very important to constrain the Fed in two ways. One is to say that when you have the threat of deflation, you take the measures to make sure deflation doesn't occur. But also, when the deflationary threat is over, you make sure that you don't allow inflation to occur. And again, the reason I actually strongly advocated that in my writings over many years is because I very strongly believe that you don't want to depend just on individuals. You want to also depend on institutions. One of the things when, you, when um, uh, I've done policy work for a long time, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, my research was always very policy oriented. I actually became an economist because my father, all he ever talked about, I told you the story about my father and, and uh, um, my grandfather losing a store. What happened to my father was that he had to drop out of day school and then go to night school at City College and support, his, support the entire family. And my father, who fought in World War II, never talked about World War II, although I always wanted to hear the stories because I always loved war movies. All he ever talked about was what it was like during the Great Depression. And that's one of the reasons why I became, uh, um, uh, uh, became an economist, because I wanted to understand 
uh, what kind of policies help prevent Great Depressions and what you need to do. And, and unfortunately, I never expected that I would have to use that knowledge in a policy-making context, which unfortunately I had to. And I think the key, the key issue here is, gee, you know, I just forgot my, uh, <laughs> this happens to me. It's actually, I, it's not senility. It's, I've been doing this, my wife tells me that I lose my train of thought, and I've been doing it ever since we were married, which is over 30 years ago. Uh, so I just lost my train of thought. So maybe we'll go to the next question, because uh, I got on a roll there. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mishkin. Oh, I, I hate to end on that note. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you have done a great job of giving us uh, a little bit more of the picture of this ugly economy, and it sounds like we all have a lot of work to do uh, yet in front of us. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank you.